where she then became the head of the math department for eight years. And now she's the dean of the faculty of engineering. And her thesis was on classical algebraic geometry. Her subject is still algebraic geometry, but she shifted to more applied aspects to kinematics and now to the algebraic geometry of uh, data or data, I don't know how to pronounce it. And this is what she's going to talk to us about today. So Sandra, I'm very happy to listen to you. Thank you very much, Alicia, for the kind introduction. I'm sharing my screen. I don't know if you... Yes. Uh, but I, I, I don't see it complete. I Now it's uh, okay. Now it should be complete, I hope. Yeah. Um, let me just do one thing about the pointer, as usual. Okay, great. So, so, this what, so what, sorry, what, sorry, one second. I'm, I forgot to say that please ask your questions in the... Um, either in the chat, at, at the end you can ask questions aloud. For the moment, please ask your questions uh, in the chat and we will collect them. And after the talk, so the talk will be recorded, maybe it's probably being recorded already now. And, but after the talk, we will stop the recording and we can still have a small like a coffee break for a few minutes before saying bye-bye in, in a very, abrupt form. Okay, please okay. go ahead. It sounds like a good plan, thank you. So algebraic geometry of uh, data, um, the, my, oops, sorry. Oh, like this. So the plan of the talk is uh, uh, to, to convey how uh, algebraic models can be uh, useful. So algebraic models is, uh, is actually something that uh, appears even quite naturally in many problems in science. And uh, in order to understand and solve these problems, uh, we need to choose points on a solution set of polynomial systems. And this is what we call sampling. I will define everything I'm saying. So I'm just now explaining what my goal is. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, very classical uh, aspects in algebraic geometry have uh, have been very useful and even fundamental in order to solve and sampling the problems. So let me see. Yeah. Okay. So as I said, uh, often uh, in in various. Uh, aspects in science, uh, certain constraints are easier to actually describe via polynomial equations. So we are all often faced, uh, facing the problem of solving a system of polynomial equations. Now there is always the dilemma of, of, of uh, where we solve the system. So we are, of course, uh, in, in most cases interested in real solutions, but is it often actually convenient and even uh, often necessary to uh, look at complex solution because we need algebraically closed ground fields. And even more than that, uh, it's, uh, it's very convenient to actually compactify the space we are uh, looking at the solutions in, uh, which means that we don't regard these polynomials as a fine polynomials anymore. Often we homogenize these polynomials. And this simply means that we are compactifying our space with the project space. So I will be interchanging freely between real solution, complex solution, and projective solution. And projective solution can even be real projective or complex projective. But this is not the focus of the talk. So I will actually skip to define where I am. Um, OK. Numerically uh, com solving polynomial system is the, up the ultimate goal, find solutions of polynomial systems. So there are several uh, software, um, several um, actual softwares available. Uh, I am uh, personally very keen on using uh, two kinds of softwares who actually use algebraic geometry and uh, the, the very core of algebraic geometry. And this is Bertini Real, or, uh, uh, developed in the US, uh, and Notre Dame University, and homotopy continuation, 
which is a Julia software and is being developed in Germany at Leipzig and the Max Planck Institute. Both softwares use so-called homotopy continuations. So you actually solve a different system of polynomials, which is called the starting system, and then using the original system construct continuous homotopies. So you degenerate all the solutions to the, the actual solutions of your given system. So there is a well understood way of numerically solving these systems of, uh, of polynomials. Okay, so why sampling and what I mean by sampling? Well, we need to study solutions of polynomial systems, which means that we have to give these um, solutions to our customers. This means that I have to give you points. Of course, I, we are humans and I can always deliver a finite number of points if I have to list them, right? So when we talk about solution of polynomial systems, of course, the solution set can have very high dimensions. And by sampling the solution set, I mean giving or choosing a finite number of points of solution points. Now, of course, this finite number of solution points have to be enough to answer the original problem, which means that this finite set of points that I choose on a certain geometric shape have to actually, re, um, have to actually describe the characteristics of, of uh, the original problems. So now what I, what, I, what I care about, because I am a, a geometer, I care about assembling solution points that actually respect the shape of the original solution points. So, and respecting the shape for me means with respect to the topology of the original of original variety, the solution points of the polynomial systems is what we call a variety, an algebraic variety. So that's what I will be talking a lot today. So here there are two aspects of the problem, which is, which are both very important for solving the problem. The first one is, is assembling. Assembling means choosing points. How can we effectively choose points on a given variety? The other problem is to choose points in a way so that I have a guaranteed recovery of the original topology. Okay, so this is a problem that has been there uh, has been studied for, of course, a long time. Uh, quite recently, there has been a, a spike of, of interest. Here I'm listing some recent papers. Right? If you are interested, you can go back to the list and uh, start looking at some of them. Okay, before starting uh, talking about sampling, let me go back to the algebraic modeling. So the solving polynomial systems. I, at the beginning I said, this is a natural thing. They appear naturally in many problems. So one problem that I like a lot and I usually use as a, as a proof that actually polynomial systems do appear in real life and in places that maybe one doesn't really uh, expect uh, is, is actually kinematics. So if we look at this, this mechanism, in kinematics, this mechanism is called the six revolute serial chain linkage, okay? So in general, a K revolute serial chain link linkage is a machine of that type having K numbers of bars, which are joined um, together and the joints can move freely in R3. Okay, this, if you, if you really look at all the pieces, it has six bars joined together. Okay? And in kinematics, there are two um, problems attached to, a, to such a, 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 a linkage. One is called the forward kinematic problem and the other is called the inverse kinematic problem. Let me now focus on the inverse kinematic problem, which is the following. Choosing a point in space I would like to know in how many ways I can construct a, a six, for example, or a K bar machine that reaches this point. 
Okay, so think about these machines as an, an uh, as agglomerating a certain number of bars and having a hand at the at the at the end. This hand has to reach this given point. So, in how many ways? Of course, these ways are parameterized by the angles through the uh, the the different joints and the movements that they can do. And that's a problem that can be uh, modeled by polynomial equations, okay, in many variables, of course. And the nice thing is that, I will not go into many details, is that this, uh, if this um, um, joins, this, um, these machines, uh, or every such um, configuration of bars can be identified with a point on a on, on an algebraic variety, on a solution of a number of polynomial uh, systems. So every such machine or every such configuration is identified with a point living on a co-dimension one space in P7. Okay? This variety is described by a degree two polynomial. In fact, P7, which is the projective space of R8, if you, if you, if you uh, divide the coordinate in R8 in the first four and the uh, last four, and you call the first ones uh, Q and the last ones P, then this quadric is simply defined by such uh, uh, tuples having, uh, being sort of orthogonal to each other. So where PQ is zero. This is called the Studi quadric. It's something quite classical in, in kinematics and in geometry. And each side, each such um, revolute machine lives as a point in this, uh, in this quadric, okay? So this is a six dimensional uh, variety in P7, okay? How do you use, so how do you solve such a problem? And this even classically in kinematics. Well, what you do is to split the problem in two pieces. So we start with six bars. I hope you see six bars here. Then take the, the uh, fourth bar and split it in two, okay? This creates two new, so instead of having one uh, six bar with a hand. You have now two, three bars with two hands and your original problem that was given this machine and given this point, describe all the possible configuration reaching this point, can be translated to, well, given this machine again, as, as, sorry, given this point, this point now has become the base points of this new three bar, in how many ways you can construct this and this so that they meet here, right? So instead of an inverse six bar problem, we are looking at intersections or we are looking at uh, common solutions of two, three inverse kinematic problems. Okay. So a six, an inverse six bar problem is known uh, if uh, in, in, in the generic assumptions is known to have, to have a finite number of solutions. There are finite number of such angle configurations reaching a given point if you have six bars. These are exactly 16, in fact. A 3R problem does not have a finite number of possible configurations, but it has a surface of possible configurations. So two a two-dimensional solution set. So the, this finite, solu finite solution set of the six bar can be obtained by intersecting these two two-dimensional solution sets of these two three-bar problems. So F and G, living in the quadric, which is an algebraic variety in P7. So everything reduces to an intersection problem. It, this is intersection of two, of, two, of two projective varieties. So if you use intersection theory, 
you, you describe these varieties in the appropriate showering, if you know intersection theory, and then you, you compute intersection theory and you get the number 16. Okay? The nice thing is that what we did uh, actually some time ago is that this geometry, and even more, there is a certain number of C star actions that govern the, the 6R uh, um, problem, in particular, the, stu the study quadric, can be used to actually define these homotopy continuations, these actual degenerations that you need to solve this problem. So here you can use algebraic geometry to actually construct an efficient algorithm to find uh, this, to actually to solve this kinematic problem. Right? Okay. Now let's go back to sampling. So I, I hope I convince you that we, we do have to solve polynomial systems. And we do, and we are in fact, in order to present a, a solution, we, we need to choose points. So we need to have a sampling. So let me define what we mean by sampling in a more mathematical way. So we start with a variety uh, in Rn. And a sampling is just a finite number of points on the variety, which I will typically call E. I would like to introduce the concept of epsilon sample, just because the density of a sample will, we will see is very important to actually recover the characteristics of, of this variety. So we will call it a, a, an epsilon, sorry, a, a sample E, an epsilon sample, if every, for every point on the variety, sorry, if every point on the variety is at epsilon distance to some point of the sample, okay? Then of course, let me define also in a bit more formal way, what do we mean by recovering the shape of, of, of the variety? Well, once we have an epsilon sample, we can look at the union of all balls of radius epsilon centered at the sample points. We can look at the, at the nerve of this uh, union uh, and this check complex, what we, is usually denoted by R epsilon, okay? We require that this check complex has the same topology as the original variety. By, by saying this, we actually say that the sampling is uh, of the same shape of the variety or is, or, or is a topological signature of the variety, okay? And why am I stressing this density and this epsilon? Why, why is it important to understand which density and which epsilon is, is good enough? Well, that it was I said now. Well, let's look at this variety. If we just start giving a, a number of points, let's choose a number of points on the variety and let's try, let's now look at balls of various radius. So of course we can take very tiny balls, but we can then increase this epsilon. We can increase the, the, the radius of the balls, but at some point we actually increase it too much in order to preserve the shape of the variety, right? So we started with something like this and we create something that has two cycles, right? So this is too much. I mean, somehow we have to understand when, we, when, when it is too much, when the, when the sample that we choose and the, and the density that, that we choose is too big. At the same time, we don't want a too small uh, density either because we have to recover the whole variety. So it's, um, understanding the, the, the density is uh, actually a, the fundamental problem here in, in uh, sampling. Let's look at the same thing, but now considering thickening of, uh, of uh, the given variety. So we consider tubular neighborhoods around the, uh, the variety X of radius R. We do the same thing, and of course the radius becomes, at some point, it creates it, it, some singularity. So it becomes too large in order to recover the variety. Now, the, 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 this, the, the radius of, of um, so in this picture, uh, the radius of, uh, of the sampling or half of the distance of this 
segment that you see this. This is an invariant of the uh, manifold that we will call reach of the manifold. This is also a very classical uh, notion. And actually this line, the line between these two points is also something that will play a, from a, an important role and it's, it's, it's called a bottleneck line. And a bottleneck line, why? Because this line is normal to this surface at both points. You see that this, this line is actually orthogonal to the tangent line at this point and at this point. So what is the reach of a, of a manifold? Okay, so this is the formal definition of, uh, of the reach, okay? Let me just give you, uh, yeah, it's, it's simple. Let me just walk you th through um, everything that is written here. Well, we start with a compact smooth manifold, okay? So every time we have a compact uh, smooth, smooth manifold and, and every time we choose a point in the ambient space, in this case Rn, well, we know that there is a well-defined distance. So there is a point, there is some point on the variety obtaining the minimum distance from this given point in the ambient space to the variety, okay? This is compactness, okay? So we can look at the thickening of a given radius r. So given a, a, a real number r, so we look at all the points in the ambient space which are of distance r to the variety, okay? Of course, when I say that the distance is obtained by some points, these some points might not be a unique point. It might be more than one point, okay? So we might, we want to concentrate at all the thickenings obtained by all points having a unique point obtaining the distance. And then we take the maximum, right? So here you see that the maximum is exactly this one because at this thickening, we have two points obtaining the maximum distance, okay? So this is called the reach. And of course, not, not so surprisingly, from the heuristics that we have been uh, saying so far, well, one can prove, and this is what, uh, this is a nice theorem uh, that has been proven, uh, that if we take an epsilon sample of the variety with epsilon strictly less than the reach, then we can be sure that this sample recovers the topology of the variety. Okay. So now the problem, the, our original problem, which was construct a sample and make sure that this sample recovers the topology of the variety, can be translated to compute the reach. Because once we compute the reach, if we can construct a sample, then we know which density we need. Okay. So how do we compute the reach? Well, the definition that I gave you before, well, it's a nice definition, but computationally is not something that you can apply. But there is a well understood uh, upper bound, actually two well understood upper bounds for, for the reach. So the reach has been proven to be the minimum of two invariants, of two quantities. One is called the minimum radius of, of curvature of X. This is what I denote by rho of, of X. And the other one, which I denote by B of X, is called the bottleneck of the variety, okay? So the bottleneck is what we saw before. Let me now define it for you. So I look at all pair of points on the variety having a common normal line, okay? Which means that I look at all pair of points such that each point in the pair lives in the normal space of the other point, okay? This is an equivalent way of defining it. And then we take the minimum 
So every such pairs, and then we compute the distance and we take the minimum one. Okay. This is called the bottleneck of the, the, this line is called the bottleneck line and the two points are called the bottleneck pairs. Okay. So, so now we wanted to compute the reach, but now we see that if we can compute the minimal radius, the, the, the curvature rho of, of x, and the bottleneck, then we take the minimum and we have the reach, okay? Now, of course, this is not easy computation either. And especially the curvature is a very known uh, complexity, um, complexity, a hard problem. The bottlenecks, on the other hand, might be more accessible and have been proven to be more accessible, especially if we have a finite number of computations to do, okay? Because this B of X could be infinite, okay? So the first question is, when can we expect to have a finite number of uh, such bottleneck lines so that we just check it's a finite problem and then compute the, the bottleneck? And how do we do that? Well, this is what I want to talk about now. But before that, let me just give you an example of the number or, or how many bottlenecks even a simple curve can have. This is a QWERTY curve. Right? A QWERTY curve in, uh, in uh, if you want, in P2 or in C2. So it's a very simple uh, object. Nevertheless, well, it has a finite number of bottlenecks and it has 22 bottleneck lines, okay? They are all real in this case, right? You see, but, and the problem is find them. This is a solving a polynomial system, it can be done. And if you have a finite number of them, then you just check. Okay. So during the rest of the talk, what I want to talk about is the bottlenecks and the fact that actually bottlenecks can suffice to give an efficient and a density uh, proven sampling. We actually, in many cases, can forget about the curvature, okay? So I will concentrate on sampling via bottlenecks. I will try to convince you again by a sort of more uh, real life problem uh, from biochemistry. And then at the end, I, I hope I will have some time to tell you that this is nothing strikingly new. Everything started in, already in the 18th century and this is very classical algebraic geometry which is behind all of this. This story that I will give you now is a more original story and uh, is is it has been possible because of collaboration with uh, very, very smart young people. Uh, these are the th my three collaborators. Uh, David Eklund, who is, who is a, a researcher at RISE, uh, the Research Institute of uh, Sweden uh, at the moment. Uh, Oliver uh, Jeffert is one of my graduate students and Maddie Weinstein, she's a graduate student at Berkeley. Okay, so finiteness. We wish to have a finite number of bottleneck lines, these pairs, okay? And in fact, that's the case for generic complete intersections. So complete intersections means that my solution set, the solution set of a polynomial system has the dimension or has the co-dimension equal to the number of polynomials in the polynomial system. So you can think of it as a, a solution system having the expected, the expected dimension. So this is not something weird to, to require. It happens very often. Okay? So, and generic means that we take generical polynomial 
systems. So the coefficients are chosen generic. So this is not the end of the world because even if you are given a polynomial system, you can sort of disturb it a little bit. You can degenerate it a little bit and, and you can make it generic. So we proved that for this kind of polynomial systems, we can expect finitely many bottlenecks. Okay? This is a finite number. And then we actually give a, a, an algorithmic construction of a sample of the variety X. So that's something that of course, one can do in, in, in many ways. Sampling is something that has been doing and will be doing, and there are ways of, of, of doing and, and of doing it efficiently, more efficiently, less efficiently, depending on, on the problem. This construction that we present is something that fits our story in order to guarantee the density at the end. The way we construct a sample is actually in a sort of an expected way. Okay? What we do, we take grids. So we take generic projections onto planes of different sizes. And then we take pullbacks of grids on these planes. So we choose certain lattices on each on, uh, on each projection. So by doing this, we obtain a finite number of points uh, on the variety. This turns out not to be sufficient. So what the additional idea is to actually, for every grid, if you understand what I mean, to look at some complementary, complementary space and using what we call the sorry, the Euclidean distance degree, which basically means picking up the nearest point from the variety to this complementary um, space. So this is a construction that is, is based on two stages, okay? And this is something that we called S delta. Well, delta is, is, the, is basically the size, the length of the grid, okay? So given a length, we we can actually construct a sampling. And the result I want to uh, give you is, is the following, is that if you choose a length, so if you choose a delta, such that delta times the square root of the ambient dimension is strictly less than the minimum between a chosen epsilon and the bottleneck degree, which is finite, then this sample that we construct is an epsilon sample. So it's a sample where, uh, such that all the points on the variety is at epsilon distance from some point of the sample. Okay? So basically what we do is that if I give you an epsilon, I can choose a delta such that I can construct you an epsilon, an epsilon sample. Okay. And what is nice about it is that this construction can gives you a sampling that actually is of the same shape of the given variety up to the first homology. Okay, that's the drawback. Okay. So what do I mean by this? So what we prove is that if the so we can construct an epsilon sample for you. And if this epsilon is strictly less than the bottleneck degree, not to the reach, but the bottleneck degree, then this epsilon sample that is, co is it constructed in that way has an associated modified Vietor, um, Vietoris Rips complex. So it has an associated CW complex of, of dimension two 
whose zeroth and first homology is the same as the variety, as the ones of the variety, which means that I can detect the connectedness of the variety, I can detect the loops on the, on the variety, and this is good enough for many things in real life that you want to detect and many problems that you want to, to solve. Why this is good enough? Well, let me apply this to something that maybe can be fun to look at and to solve, okay? Let me give you an example of one application of such reasoning, okay? And the example is what is called the uh, cyclooctane molecule, right? The cyclooctane molecule is in pictures, this one, uh, it consists of eight atoms, uh, carbon atoms linked in a certain way and they are bounded to each other following certain symmetries and, and forming a ring. Okay, so we have this thing. And it, it, it is an interesting problem, important problem. I don't really know much about, about the problem, but, but my sense is that it has been well studied in, uh, in biochemistry. People are interested in sort of configuration spaces of the atoms, okay? In how many ways you can actually compose these atoms via, so you can view this even as a graph if you take every, uh, sorry, this molecule, not atoms. You can view this even as a graph if, you, if every atom corresponds to a vertex and, and, uh, and, so, and so forth. So the configuration space of such a molecule is known in biochemistry to, to have dimension two. So it's a two dimensional space. And actually it has been studied even, even topologically. So there is uh, an article from 2010. That I don't know if there is something more now, but in this article, they actually claim that this configuration space is two dimensional and uh, it has two components in fact. One which is, they call it spherical because it looks like a sphere. It has the homology of a sphere or it looks like a sphere. And the other one is actually homologically uh, uh, like a, a, a Klein bottle. So what we did is the following. Well, if, we, if you look at this molecule, okay, you can view it as a graph. We view it as a, Revolut chain machine. So you have eight atoms here. We consider these eight atoms as eight joints, okay, of a eight bar, of an eight bar mechanism. Okay, so so remember this mechanism have a, 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 an origin, then they have a number of bars with joints, and then a, a hand at the end. So here you have an eight bar, but you can imagine that the end co coincides with the, uh, with the origin. So it's a closed, it's a particular, it's not a generic eight uh, R um, um, such a machine, but it's a closed one, okay? That's not important. The important thing is that we can use the kinematic model, which is polynomial systems, to model this problem. Okay, so now this is basically can be can be translated to an eight bar inverse kinematic problem. So given a point in space, in how many ways? What is the the all all possible configurations? So what is the configuration space obtaining this point? Well, at the beginning I talked about a six bar inverse kinematic problem having a finite number of solutions. And I solved it by intersecting solutions of two, three bar inverse kinematic problem, which were three dimensional solutions, okay? So now what is the dimension of a, uh, the, the expected dimension of an eight bar inverse kinematic problem? Well, in general, uh, you can actually study the, the, um, this um, solution space as um, maps from a certain uh, number uh, of P1s to a certain number of, of, of P1s and actually 
I'm being very vague here, but but you you actually can uh, understand the dimension of uh, uh, this space by looking at fibers of a certain algebraic map. Okay, so if you do that, you realize that the dimension of a solution set for an, a k bar inverse problem is is always k minus six. Okay. So for a six bar, it was zero dimensional, six minus six, right? For a three bar it was three dimensional, was, was a six minus three. This one is for eight bar is eight minus six, which is two, okay? So here it, it's not, it's actually not uh, so um, surprising that we get a two dimensional as originally claimed, a two dimensional solution set, okay? So this is a surface. And the configuration space of, of, uh, of, of this problem is a surface. And we know this e even via a kinematic model. Okay? So this has dimension two. Moreover, the kinematic problem associated, which is having eight joints, will can be reduced to a, a, a polynomial system uh, having variables depending on uh, the, the eight angles of the joints. So here I, I list this, uh, this sort of, uh, this is not exactly the, the angles, this is something connected to the angles, but there are eight coordinates, uh, delta zero, delta one until delta seven. It's done in this way because they live in P7. So uh, it's, uh, it's all uh, given by homogeneous polynomials, but nevertheless, you can observe that there are certain symmetries that are carried out through the problem, okay? So it's actually mathematically very natural to expect to look at the solutions which are invariant via certain symmetries. For example, this one, right? This is, this, I just define one possibility. And if we do that, so we have a polynomial system we solve the polynomial system using our sampling and we pick a density for a sample using the bottleneck. The bottleneck is also something that now we can compute, okay? Because it's finite. And that's what we get, okay? We get two components, okay? There is one component that is invariant uh, to this, to the symmetry. This is the so-called the so-called spherical component. is in fact uh, it, it has the homology of a sphere, and then there is a second component, as expected, as as claimed, which has the the, the homology of a Klein bottle, and even the picture sort of suggests it. These are actually two irreducible components. These are not uh, this, the, the surface turns out to be connected, okay, but with two irreducible components. Okay, so everything now uh, is, is getting, uh, I hope, even, even for you, a little bit hopeful. Uh, so we can sampling, we can uh, deduce um, the right density, and the right density is now only depending on the bottleneck degree. So what about this bottleneck degree? How, we can, how can we compute this, this bottleneck degree in advance? Do we really have to compute all points or is there a way of estimating what is this degree? And, and this is where actually algebraic geometry and classical algebraic geometry comes in. So, so now let's, this is one place where it's important to move to the complex numbers. Uh, in algebraic geometry, most of, what, most of the techniques that we have are defined for algebraically closed fields fields. So we want uh, to start with a smooth variety in, uh, in the complex affine space, Cn. Again, we will have to do intersection theory on these varieties. So we want some basic um, assumptions to be uh, true. For example, we want two lines always to intersect and, and, and so forth. So we, we will want to close this variety in the projective space. So we, we compactify 
the problem, okay? And for the purpose of counting this, this bottleneck, this is a number associated to the solution set of a polynomial system to a variety. We actually define in a very uh, technical, so I will not do it for you, but we define a degree, what we call the bottleneck degree of the variety. It's an invariant of, of the variety, of the, of, the, of the closure of the variety in, uh, in Pn. And for our purposes, under certain genericity assumptions, this bottleneck degree actually is exactly the number of bottlenecks that we want to compute. Okay? It might be a little bit more complicated if we have embedded components or, and other things. But under certain genericity assumptions, this will be the case. And what do we mean by genericity assumptions? And again, I will be very vague, but these this genericity assumptions are assumptions of the position of the variety with respect to a quadric that I denoted by Q. And what is this quadric? Okay, the quadric is basically the quadric define, uh, that defines our geometry. So remember that we want to look at bottlenecks. Bottlenecks are given by points have, having a common normal line, which means that we have to define a concept of orthogonality okay, in our complex space. Okay? The complex of orthogonality can be defined in a classical way using Euclidean geometry and Euclidean uh, normality. For example, using this quadric, so this, the sum of all the coordinates square equals zero is what we are used to uh, as a concept of orthogonality. This is a quadric in Cn, is a codimension one subvariety of dimension two, which is usually called the isotropic quadric. Okay? But we might change the quadric. We might change our concept of orthogonality. We might, we, we might want some distortion, some noise in our problem. I will not, of course, talk about this. But this general position can be made as general as possible and can be made a, 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 an assumption with respect to a quadric of our choice. And the quadric of our choice will define the geometry of our choice. Okay. okay, now that's the theorem. And I don't expect you to even read what is there. But for completeness, I, I just wanted to, to state it. What this theorem is saying is that the bottleneck degree, which is in most cases finite, and it's the number that we are looking for in order to bound the density of our sampling, is given by a, if you want, an equation in uh, quantities that are very classical and very natural in, in algebraic geometry. Both this uh, epsilon i's and this bman are polynomials in so-called polar classes. So you have certain sums of uh, uh, powers of uh, polar classes. Right? So we start with a the variety, then we have all these object polar classes, and suddenly Certain polynomials in these polar classes give you the density of your sampling. Okay? Now, what are these polar classes? I will not define polar classes for you. Let me just give you uh, an, an, an example. Oh, this is a theorem that you can find on, the, on, the, uh, on this paper. Um, you can actually translate this formula. This formula can, can appear much less uh, frightening if you have small co-dimension and better understood uh, varieties. For example, if you have a curve in P2, the bottleneck degree is given simply by the degree. It's a polynomial in the degree. If you have a curve in P3, you need the genus and the degree and, and, and so forth. And then all these PIs appear. The more you go on, the more PIs. You, these PIs are, are what I call polar classes. There are, if, and, and the polar classes are sub-varieties on the, the variety 
uh, and you have as many as the dimension of the variety. So for a curve, you have a zeroth polar class, which is the variety itself, and you have a one, uh, a first polar class, which is a number of points. For a surfaces, you have a zero, a first, and a second, and so forth. And there are some varieties. So whatever I'm writing here as a product is the intersection product be between the sub varieties in the Chow ring of the variety, if, if you know what I mean. Okay, but the, this, this is actually products. You can think of it as, as, as products. So I will not define uh, what a polar class is, but let me just give you one example. And this is a curve. So I said the curve in P2 the simplest curve, a conic in, in P2, you have two polar classes, the curve itself or the first polar classes. The first polar classes is a bunch of points on the variety. It's a co-dimension one. So on the curve is a zero dimensional sub-variety. And how do you find it? Well, you pick a point in the ambient space, a generic point P, and you look at all the points on your variety whose tangent line goes through P, okay? So whose tangent line has intersection non-empty with the peaked point, okay? There are exactly two, X and Y, okay? So the first polar class for a conic in P2 is a zero-dimensional uh, sub-variety of degree two, okay? Why do I say that? Because of course, everything I'm saying is independent on the point that I pick. And in general, of course, we will not pick points, we will, put, we will pick generic uh, linear spaces on the ambient space, and we look at similar tangent, uh, tangent conditions. So we will produce higher and higher dimensional sub-varieties of the original variety. Okay? And this is not surprisingly is, is, is not so su surprising because we, I mean our original problem of sampling relied on tangency and, and actually normality uh, of the variety. So we, we need this kind of, of, uh, of reasoning. Let me finish by telling you that this is something that this way of thinking of genericity and, 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 and tangential properties it's something that is very classical, as of course, as, as, as Italian, I, I like classical algebraic geometry, and I think this is important to say every time. Now, I will not mention many Italians, but Segre. But it, it started already in the 18th century and beginning of 19th century. Uh, Segre at, and, and Nutter actually defined these polar varieties and observed that segregate just for surfaces and not in general, that actually certain linear combinations are intrinsic for the variety, do not depend on the embedding. And then Severi and Todd used these linear combinations to define the churn classes of the varieties. So the churn classes that we are used to compute via vector bundles and tangent bundles and, and normal bundles were originally defined by via polar varieties. So this is the, the most, one of the most classical objects you can think of in algebraic geometry, of course. Now, if X is, is non-singular, these polar varieties are churn classes. These are certain combinations are churn classes of the variety, but actually the actual polar varieties are churn classes of certain vector bundles, which I call J. This is the first jet bundle of the, of the variety. Again, very very uh, much linked to the differential properties of the variety is one of the main actors in, in, in differential geometry. So all this is in fact, so we rediscovered something that of course has been important all, all along. And as you, as you understood, a lot is based on computing this polar classic, is classes intersecting them and, 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 and then as a giving, in order to, in order to give a finite number that then would become the bottleneck of the degree. So there is a lot of numerical intersection to be done there. 
this is what we have called the, the, the polar calculus. And uh, we have a paper where we actually describe geometrically what to do and, and actually numerically how, how to set algorithms to compute all these uh, intersections and even intersections with, the cert with other divisors on the, on the variety and uh, so forth. So if I now tell you again how I started, I hope you understand what I mean by algebraic models being useful and what I mean by sampling algebraic varieties and how this is actually fundamental for solving this original problems. And I hope in the very short, very, very short time at the end, I convince you that everything relies on very classical uh, algebraic geometry. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any questions for Sandra? Yes, yeah, Teresa. I have a comment. Yeah. Uh, nice talk, Sandra. But Thank I you. just wanted Thank to you. mention that mm -hmm. you cited as an inspiration the work by Burgisser, Cooker, and Leres. But actually, their work is on basic semi algebraic sets. And the right reference for your case, which was a variety case, is a previous work that they were based on. And it's a work by Cooker, Schub, and myself. Okay, sorry, Teresa. Okay, I, 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 I'm not an expert in this, so I, I'm sure I missed a lot. Okay, thanks, Teresa. Okay. <laughs> 2016 and you were in the audience. Aha, okay. Well, this shows how much attention. Okay. Thank you, Teresa. I'm sorry about that. Okay. I will make sure to change it when I refer to it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it has been recorded. It has been recorded. Yes. Yes. So people know now. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> It's nice to, I mean, I, I, this is the paper that I know. And uh, I think it, uh, probably your paper is mentioned there, right? But they have the long proof of this theorem. So I thought, okay. What we do in our paper, we, give the, we compute the homology of um, real algebraic sets, real varieties, sorry, real varieties. And what we do is to compare the reach with the condition number. Yes. And this allows us to compute the NERC and take everything from the nerve. Okay, so so basically you prove the same thing then. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Okay, but thank only you. For varieties. Only for varieties. They only for varieties. varieties. Yeah. But, yeah. I see, I see. Thank you. I have a question. Um, hi, I'm Jimena. Hi. Um, a very nice talk. I would like to know uh, which was the problems or the drawbacks because you say that you could recover uh, the, the, the first uh, degrees of the homology uh, just using the bottleneck invariant. Yeah. I, I suppose that for higher dimensions you should need uh, or you need the, uh, uh, the reach or not, uh, which was the problem to so, the higher dimensions. Right, so for, for the sampling that we have um, allows us to use a, this, this to, to actually modify this, a, the classical Vietoris Rips uh, complex uh, up to dimension, so dimension zero, one, and two, um, in order to recover. Over that, it, it doesn't work. I mean, at least the way we do it, it doesn't work. So that's the reason why we can recover all, only the zeroth and the first homology. What we can do with our uh, sampling is to actually and just this theorem, we can actually improve this theorem a little bit. So in, we, we put a fraction here. Now I don't remember which one. It's, it's not that exciting, but that's the only thing that we can do in order to recover the whole the whole uh, the whole homology, but it still requires the reach. Yeah. Okay. Yes, there is some uh, previous result um, proved by Ismail and Dijogi that mm -hmm. it's related with this result, but it's for general manifolds. Um, general manifolds. Okay. Yes. Okay. A result on the on the reach or on the bottleneck? No, it's uh, it uses the reach. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Epsilon has to be the half of the reach, and then you recover the homotopy type of your manifold. Mm, okay. And under some conditions with high probability, there are many. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I see. Well, the high probability. I mean, we we do numerical computations, so okay. that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? <clears throat> If there are no more uh, kind of formal questions, then we can thank uh, Sandra again. We can stop the recording and maybe just say bye bye in a more relaxed way. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.